This seems familiar. <laughs> From Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord God, your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has, is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. And then from 2 Corinthians. And what verses am I supposed to read? I forgot my paper. Chapter 4, starting 5 to 12. 5 to 12, OK. Paul writes, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that all this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So please stand. Our gospel reading comes to us from the gospel of Mark chapter 2. Glory to you, O Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which, was, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, the Sabbath was, not, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time when he went into the synagogue and a man was a sh w with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see what if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. And he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. (laughs) 
I remember when I was a kid, when I was in Sunday school as a kid, and at the time, and maybe, maybe many of you remember this as well in your growing up years in Sunday school, if you went, we, we told stories with flannel graph. Do any of you know what that is? Do any of you remember what flannel graph is? For those of you that don't know what flannel graph is, it was this board that was made of flannel material. And there was usually some sort of picture that was painted on the flannel that represented the background scene. And then there were these characters that were, or objects that were made out of paper, cut out of paper, <laughs> and stuck to the flannel board. And as the story unfolded, we moved them around as the story was told. And so the, the paper had some sort of adhesive on the back side of it so that it would somehow stick to the flannel background, the flannel graph. Anyway, I remember when our Sunday school teacher was teaching us about the Pharisees. Teaching us about the Pharisees and us, the students, we would we'd move these paper cutout figures around on the flannel graph to help tell the story. And I don't know exactly why it was that I remember this particular lesson that the Pharisees and the, and the flannel graph, but I do. I remember hearing our teacher telling us about those Pharisees and that we as Christians were much better than they were because, after all, Christians aren't mean like the Pharisees were. Christians don't treat other people like that because Christians, we are better than them. And I distinctly remember, distinctively remember the strict moralistic teaching and hearing of how certain people were bad and that if we only, if only us we went to church and went to Sunday school on a regular basis and if we prayed every day and were nice to our friends that we were the good people. And there was this very strict boundary with who was good and who was bad. Can any of you relate to that teaching? You remember that? This flannel graph storytelling was reduced to an oversimplistic moral story. And it was made very clear to us which side of the moral story we were to be on. And it was always so laden with guilt. If we didn't live a certain way, that guilt would be heaped on our shoulders. So there was usually a lot of shame hanging over our shoulders. The reason the Pharisees were so adamant about following their traditions and their rules and the reason that we oftentimes do the same is because human beings like to create boundaries between those who are different. We have the tendency of being exclusive, wanting to know who is in and who is out. We create practices and behaviors in order to set ourselves apart from those who would describe, we would describe as outsiders. Author Henry Noun writes that any time we are not experiencing authentic mutual transformation, we will inevitably, inevitably be drawn toward some kind of faith that is characterized by boundaries. We will look for ways where we can set ourselves apart from those on the outside. These boundaries change from generation to generation, but they all promote the same false sense of supremacy which is fed by our desire to exclude others. The Pharisees had created boundaries by which they were able to keep certain people at arm's length. The rituals and the practices and the traditions, which are not bad in and of themselves, had become the boundary a wall that determined who was in and who was out. Those rituals and traditions, in effect, became their God. Even today, when our structures and our traditions and even our nation systems which we create are, are identified with God. When they are identified with God, we oftentimes use them as judgment against those outside of our group 
or outside of our nation system or our belief system. What we learn from this is that God can't fit into any particular one structure. God can't be reduced to one nation. God can't be reduced to one political party. God can't be reduced to one church or one belief system or one class or one group of people. In fact, as people of faith, the ways of Jesus and the kingdom of God, which, we came to, which he came to inaugurate, are the lenses through which we evaluate not only our very own lives, but also how we evaluate the systems and the structures that we create. How are our lives reflecting love and compassion? How are our systems and structures reflecting dignity and respect of all people? In today's gospel reading, the Pharisees are challenging and Jesus and his disciples for not following their interpretation of following the law, the tradition of keeping the Sabbath day holy and not working on that day. And Jesus responds, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. The point Jesus is making is not to toss out the law and tradition, not to toss it out, but to help reframe it. Reframe it in a way that restores it to its original intent. The Sabbath was set aside as a way to help people to cease from their labor, to stop producing, just as God did and rested on the seventh day in the story of creation in Genesis. So that we can rest, that we can be revived and remember who we are and that we belong to God and to one another. The Sabbath was a mark of remembrance uh, to the Jewish people and their deliverance from slavery from Egypt. Remember that story back in Exodus? The people of Israel God wanted to remind them that after they were freed from bondage and slavery in Egypt, they, he wanted them to remember, you're not a slave any longer. You don't have to work every day. You don't have to work for a cruel taskmaster. Remember that you are and you have been redeemed. Remember to rest your body so that you have energy to keep going those other six days. That's why God wanted them to have a day of rest. That's what God wants for us as well. It's, it's just not a law and a rule to make us feel guilty if we don't follow it. It's a practice to remind ourselves and each other that we are human beings, that we don't have to constantly be producing and be productive, which I know is essentially really hard for us in our American and Western culture where it's always about producing and doing more and keeping up with everyone else. Not to mention, I know that I am at least addicted to having our faces in our devices all the time, that we forget about what's around us, the gifts that God has given us to enjoy. Jesus is reminding us that it's about life, that we are human beings, not human doings, reminding us that we are connected to the God of the universe with others around us and all of creation as well, that, that life is not only about me and my own. The Sabbath itself is a gift. When I was a kid growing up, my parents in particular, my father was fairly strict on keeping, at least in our family, keeping the Sabbath on a Sunday. For us, this meant no work other than doing the work of the chores of making sure, making sure our dairy cows were milked every morning and every evening. It, it meant no work, no producing, even to the point where he sent one of our neighbors home after he showed up at our farm to help my dad with some field work. It was his Sabbath, and he wanted that for others as well. 
Anyway, one of the things that I took away from that practice of my parents was that it was not only a day of rest, a day for not producing or creating. It was also a day to connect with the beauty of God's creation in the outdoors. It was also a day to remember those that did not have people in their lives to talk to, to be with, and to love. And so Sunday also became a day on many Sundays where we regularly invited a particular neighbor of ours for over for dinner. And our, our neighbor spent much of his life alone, and my parents wanted to make sure that he knew that he was not alone. And now as kids, our, our neighbor wasn't someone who we cared much about. He was, he was kind of weird and kind of odd in our eyes, in our minds, and, and always had this, this smell about him. And we didn't care about him, we, we, let alone wanting to have him over for, for dinner. But my parents taught us that through the simple act of sharing dinner together, that we are connected, that we are responsible for reminding ourselves and each other that we are human beings. Resting, being grateful, remembering life, remembering that we are alive, remembering that we belong to God, taking time to, to be with those that we love and with others who need love and care to remember that we are connected to each other. Jesus. Jesus was always leading and pushing and prodding and shaping us towards living a life for the sake of life and wholeness and healing for us and for all people and for all of creation. The Sabbath, however you keep that in your life. On whatever day and time that works for you. The Sabbath. Remember that it is a gift. It's absolutely a gift. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And stick around for some coffee and cookies.